Hi, hello, and welcome to the Texas Human Trafficking Prevention Corning Council Strategic Plan webinar. My name is Emily Landon, and we are grateful to have you today to learn about partnering. Um, as many of you know, this is the last of our five webinar series, um, concluding the rundown of the strategic plan that the Corning Council drafted and published last year. Um, so as we kind of saw in the introduction, uh, slide. This is the final pillar to the strategic plan um, that the Corning Council drafted. And today we're going to be discussing partnering. Um, partnering um, is for here we're talking about uh, partnering between federal, state, and local jurisdictions and non-governmental organizations for increased collaboration and continuity of services. Um, before we get started, um, kind of diving into the content, I just want to let you know that um, we're going to start with a couple of poll questions, and this is just so we can understand kind of some of our attendees, the diversity of experience that we have on the call, and help so we can um, kind of tailor some of the content to make sure that it is addressing all the needs and concerns that we have. Additionally, I want to kind of bring your attention to that we have a chat box on this webinar, um, as well as a question box. So throughout the webinar, feel free to send us a question and we will have someone attending the questions. And at the very end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A where we can open up to the panelists to address your question. Um, and then finally, we have the chat box as well for you all to communicate as we go along to the webinar. As you can see as um, through the last few weeks, um, you are um, kind of able to participate uh, via viewing and any communication will just be done through the chat box. Um, with that, thank you so much for your time and let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kara Pierce and I am the section chief for the Texas Attorney General's Human Trafficking Section in Austin. Um, I hope everyone has survived uh, the last week or so. I, I feel like I'm, I'm running on fumes these days, but I'm excited to get to talk to you about our um, final aspect of our strategic plan. This one is perhaps the most important. Um, partnering in human trafficking is key. Without partnership, no one other aspect of it can be successful. And so one of the things our strategic plan identified was Government agencies alone cannot successfully combat this problem. This needs to be a joint effort on the part of government agency, non-government agencies and nonprofit organizations, social service agencies and um, religious organizations as well as business organizations. So that's what you're gonna hear about today. A big part of our plan was to encourage and develop the growth of public and private partnerships in the area of trafficking. So you're going to be hearing from a great group of panelists today. Um, I know you've been hearing a lot about the Coordinating Council, and here's who we are. Um, we have representatives from everybody on the Coordinating Council, and the Coordinating Council is perhaps one of the best examples we have of a unified partnership combating, tax, uh, combating human trafficking here in Texas. Here are all the member organizations. In addition, um, we have sought the expertise of the Human Trafficking Survivor Leaders Council. And at the end of our presentation, you're gonna be hearing a survivor's perspective on um, the strategic plan with regard to partnerships. And here are our presenters. As I mentioned, you'll be hearing from me. You'll also be hearing from Kyle Matheson from DPS, Ron Swenson from TABC, Nick Raymond, also from TABC, Mary Winston from TDLR, Kathy McGibbon Givens, who is part of our Survivor Leader Council, um, Courtney Arbor from uh, Texas Workforce Commission, Todd Ladiolis, uh, who works for the governor's office, James Lindsay, who works for uh, TW, sorry, TPWD, uh, Brandy Souls, who works for, uh, who's a program specialist with uh, Texas Health and Human Services. And from DP, DFPS, we have Dimitri and also, Sorry, I'm having a screen issue. Mm -hmm. Emily, can you pipe in? I can't see the bottom of the screen, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course, Blanca Denise. Oh, for, yes, well. Blanca Denise, I'm sorry, I was just speaking with her earlier from DFPS, thank you.
One of the things the Coordinating Council recognized was how important it is to really understand the problem of human trafficking, not just from a law enforcement perspective or a prosecutorial perspective, but understand it from an analytical perspective. And a great way to do that is to enlist researchers, um, the academics of the world who really know how to assess and deep dive into issues. And so that was one of the focuses of our um, drive to develop expertise and academic expertise that could help us further support human trafficking policy. Uh, one example of that is the North Texas Academic Collaborative on Trafficking, which was college professors and researchers interested in looking at trafficking issues. Another partner that the Coordinating Council has worked with is the Buffett McCain Institute, uh, an initiative to combat modern slavery. They have a uh, focus in particular on labor trafficking and they provide a lot of services and research and training on this issue. These are the types of um, academic and practical initiatives that can help us better quantify and understand the problem of human trafficking um, so that the other aspects, the social service providers, law enforcement and prosecutors can um, get a better grasp of the, really the scope of the problem here in Texas. As I mentioned, this isn't just uh, public partnerships. Government entities alone cannot solve this problem. Um, Texas has a great scope of non-government organizations, human trafficking regional coalitions, which are groups from various parts of Texas that work together to combat the problem, law enforcement trafficking task forces. They, have, they also have a lot of faith-based partners here in Texas who make it as part of their religious faith um, a mission to help and assist human trafficking victims and to work on prevention. And perhaps one of the most vital pieces in how to solve this problem is to ask survivors who have come out the other side of trafficking for their input in ways that we can both help on the prevention aspect and on the recognition aspect of human trafficking and on how to help survivors move on with their lives and transition um, after. One um, example of a business and government partnership that's uh, come, to about, uh, come about is the Texas business, Businesses Against Trafficking, so TBAT partnership. Um, that involves businesses who are willing to take on a pledge to help eradicate trafficking. And um, there's two different levels. There's a partner level and an associate level, and, and they can be recognized for their anti-trafficking efforts. Another great example of a collaborative organization is the Texas Human Trafficking Prevention Task Force. This is a collaborative body made up of lots of different federal, state, and local law enforcement and prosecutors, as well as many different um, social services and non-government organizations from around the state. It consists of over 50 organizations, um, and the goal is to get the word out um, around the state provide training, provide connections and networking, and also to make sure that we are hearing in Austin what the trafficking landscape looks like throughout the state of Texas. And we have organizations that focus on labor trafficking, organizations that focus in on child sex trafficking, adult sex trafficking, trafficking involving um, victims who are not United States citizens. And so through that task force, we make sure that all the trafficking um, issues and perspectives are, are represented. And I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, this is the map of Texas and these are some of the regional coalitions that exist here in the state of Texas to combat trafficking in those regions. You have West Texas, North Texas, East Texas, Central, South. And the regional coalitions are, are a really important um, function. They help, if you have a survivor who may need services in that region, you can reach out to that coalition and they can help connect that survivor with services. Um, they also often work with their respective law enforcement trafficking task forces. So just as law enforcement, federal, state, and local work together in various parts of Texas to combat trafficking, they also often partner with their respective regional coalitions and their um, charity organizations to help provide services and support for survivors and um, uh, victims in cases. Now you're going to see a list of various types of uh, partnerships that the Texas Attorney General's Office has been involved in 
um, and combating trafficking. And you'll see it's going to take a little while for all of it to, to appear because there are a lot of them. One thing I'd like for you to note on this list is that you see a lot of law enforcement, which you would expect from a prosecutor's office, but you also see um, the Texas PTA. You see TxDOT. Um, our office uh, in the last legislative session, legislation passed that uh, asked our office to partner with TxDOT to make sure that um, there was signage uh, providing information and, and resources for human trafficking in all of our transportation hubs. So that was a that was a unique partnership. You see private companies like Uber. Um, one law enforcement partnership that comes to mind uh, happened recently. I got a phone call from, well, actually our the Texas Attorney General's law enforcement um, unit got a phone call from a law enforcement officer down in South Texas where they talked about how they had encountered a young girl from Florida with some suspected human traffickers. And they, partially because of COVID and issues related to it, they didn't know where to keep her until they could figure out how to get her back to her mom in Florida. And um, initially they, uh, for a very short term, put her into juvenile detention because they didn't know where else to turn. And so that phone call got routed through to me from local law enforcement to me and I reached out to the Department of Homeland Security in that part of South Texas and we were able to get her uh, very quickly returned to her mother in Florida and that's just a great example of using these networks and partnerships to make sure that um, survivors are treated the way that they should be and, and to help expedite things because especially in this time of COVID it's harder to find residential even short-term residential placements for um, survivors and, and to make sure that their travel plans are handled appropriately. So that, that's a great example of a partnership that, that worked and it worked quickly. And now uh, you're gonna hear from Todd from the governor's office. Thanks, Kara. Uh, as Kara said, my name is Todd Latiolas. Uh, I work on Governor Abbott's child sex trafficking team and you can see here just a small sampling of some of our key partnerships around the different pillars that are outlined in the Coordinating Council strategic plan. Um, I just want to give the disclaimer, uh, you know, this is not a comprehensive list of, of our partnerships at all. Uh, I could fill an entire webinar talking about our partners around the state and to be perfectly honest with you, if you were to look at the legislation that created our team in the governor's office, our charge is so comprehensive. We are charged with improving prevention efforts, identification, immediate and long-term services. And there's just no way that we could do all of those things um, without collaborating with folks all around the state. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, I also wanted to point out, you know, we are unique in the sense that our office also administers a number of state and federal uh, grant funds. And so, uh, we have the privilege of being able to fill some of the gaps and to advance some of the statewide priorities around human trafficking with funding. Um, but from my perspective, even those grants are partnerships. Um, I used to work at a nonprofit. I know what it can sometimes be like uh, to be funded by a grant and to feel like, you know, um, you have mom or dad watching over you, waiting to monitor your activity or auditing you and making sure you're doing everything right. Um, that's really not the relationship that we want to have with our grantees. They are our partners. We are committed in um, helping them to succeed because their success individually is our collective success working together. Um, and so I think that that is, is something unique in the way that we approach our work. And we also recognize there just is not a grant or state funding or federal funding available for every single piece of this puzzle. And so I think that a key part of partnership is identifying and leveraging those existing resources, those existing organizations, those existing networks that already touch on some point um, on these different issues. And how can we align our activities and the work that's already being done to better address trafficking? Um, finally, I just I wanted to say that uh, if you want to learn more about each of these, I'm going to spotlight a few of these partnerships, but if you want to do a deeper dive, a lot of these activities are outlined in the Coordinating Council Strategic Plan, and they're also on our website at the Governor's Office. So just to highlight a few of these activities um, in Prevent, and if you attended that webinar, 
prevent and the strategic plan is really focused on preventing trafficking before it occurs. So responding before anyone is ever exploited. And a, a few unique partnerships here, you may have heard about the Can You See Me campaign, which brought together A21, which is an anti-trafficking organization, brought together the Outdoor Advertising Association of Texas, the First Lady's Office, and coalitions around the state. And we were able to get signage and billboards up, raising public awareness in over 70 different markets across the state. Um, and that didn't end up costing anything for those organizations that were partnering to do that, thanks to the generosity of A21 and outdoor advertisers. Um, so that was really unique. Uh, two more that I wanna highlight. Uh, one is the Bullock Museum, our state's history museum. Um, you may remember the Be The One documentary that the Attorney General's office released a few years ago. Uh, we challenged from the governor's office every state agency to enact training related to that. The Bullock Museum took us up on that and they were so struck by this issue that they decided to see how they could fit into this picture as a history museum. Um, and they decided to create this amazing exhibit. And we, we got to sit on the advisory committee for that exhibit's creation, but it is live now. It's called Not Alone and it focuses not just on what trafficking is and looks like, but also how we can prevent it, specifically focusing on healthy relationships and talking to middle and high school kids in an age appropriate way um, about how to prevent exploitation in themselves and in their peers. Finally, on prevent, I wanted to acknowledge one of our state agencies that's actually not part of this coordinating council, and that's TEA. Um, and TEA worked with us about a year and a half, two years ago, to update their administrative rules and guidance to schools to make it really clear that since trafficking is a form of child abuse, every school has to have policies around child abuse and trafficking. And that includes training for their staff and that includes prevention education for their students. Um, and so coming together, all of us are able to provide resources to those schools to help them understand this issue better and they don't have to recreate the real. I don't wanna to go too deep into protect and prosecute. I'm kind of lumping those together just for the sake of time, but uh, in the strategic plan that really deals with protecting in the sense of holding exploiters accountable, but also protecting the victims and survivors, providing them with the um, access to safety, making sure that they are not unintentionally punished uh, for the sins of their traffickers. They're not um, receiving a punitive response and also pr prosecuting, holding those exploiters accountable. And so from our office um, and the executive side of things, a lot of that is just providing really great trainings and resources. Um, one of the groups we work with a lot is Collective Liberty and they provide a very immersive four and a half day training. Um, they're doing a lot of work with DPS and with counties across the state and also providing access to their HT Fusion Center um, to support intelligence building on these cases. And finally, in, in the provide support category, this is really focused on, first of all, recognizing victims that exist in our state, but then providing survivors with um, what they need to meet their immediate and their long-term needs. So in terms of recognizing, uh, we scoured the country for validated screening tools, found that there were only about five that had been um, researched and shown to be effective in identifying trafficking, um, and we, from our office selected a tool from the West Coast Children's Clinic. And now we have partners all across the state that are utilizing that tool. Some as a condition of funding from our office, others because they want to do the right thing and they wanna identify these victims that they often are already serving, um, but just haven't recognized in the past. And in terms of providing services to those youth that are identified, um, yes, there has been a need for some new service um, programs, some new types of placements, some new types of shelters. Um, but the biggest thing that has been new in this regard has been advocacy programs and care coordination. And so our advocacy programs that we fund, they are there to help make sure that that kid is connected with an advocate as soon as they're identified. If there's a law enforcement recovery, they're part of that rapid response, um, helping to establish a safe and healthy connection with that child for the immediate and the long term. And in terms of care coordination, our child advocacy centers, which is an amazing network across the state, have been really critical in helping ensure that once a kid is identified and connected to services, we have a multidisciplinary team that's responding to the needs of that child, making sure that that no need falls through the through the cracks and really is 
basically the epitome of partnership because you're bringing together all of these different partners, the CAC, child welfare, sometimes juvenile probation, law enforcement, the DA's office, and some of those service providers um, to look at the needs of that child and make sure that investigation and prosecution of their exploiter is moving forward, but also that their needs are not left behind. And so with that, I have so much more that I could say. I'll, I'll save it for the question and answer. A lot of things that I've learned about how we can um, better partner all across our state, but I wanna reserve time and pass it over to our, our partners at the Department of Family and Protective Services. Blanca Denise Lance is gonna be sharing for their team. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'm Blanca Denise Lance. I'm the Director of Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation with the Department of Family and Protective Services. So thank you for having us today. And uh, like Todd, uh, our slide also represents just highlights that we wanted to bring forward today to, to spotlight some partnerships, but it is not all inclusive. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things that I think directly relate to some of the work that we're doing um, from the different categories. So when we talk about prevent and when um, Todd had mentioned earlier that it's, a, you know, it's that, you know, assisting before anything um, happens, um, before exploitation uh, has occurred. Our prevention and early intervention um, division is, uh, is an arm of our agency that I think does a lot of that upstream prevention work. And one of the things that I want to say about them is that while they don't directly provide the services, they um, partner with local nonprofits and governments and schools, um, you know, and they provide funding if and other resources to local service providers out in the community across Texas um, to support the families that, that need assistance. Um, and they offer um, a variety of programs from zero all the way to, to, um, to you know, 18 years of age. So we're talking about the whole gamut. And while they're looking at strengthening you know, the whole concept when it comes to prevention of trafficking is building strong relationships and foundations in a parent-child relationship, we find is a critical approach to uh, preventing all forms of abuse and not just trafficking. Um, it is in that relationship. So one of those things that we're looking at is um, supporting healthy development for very young children. And so they have programs that offer a lot of various home visiting programs that ideally are strengthening that parent-child relationship at an early age um, for potential and vulnerable um, young youth. Um, and the idea is that we're not only working to strengthen that parent relationship, but the parent is also becoming aware of community programs and partnership and establish a network that can be um, wrapped around a family so that should they ever find themselves in need in the future, they can also uh, reach back out to, to those community programs and either seek additional resources or services along the way. But one of the other areas that I want to, you know, it's not all about the young relationships, the six and under, but it's also about um, the youth relationships and helping families maneuver that adolescent, adolescent pr um, program process. Uh, and so the uh, Family and Youth Success Program specifically targets families who are in day-to-day in -day conflict and struggles. And the idea is that they're working to promote strong families and building youth resiliency, which is critical um, to helping prevent future um, dilemmas from kind of coming along um, and having some trafficker come along and take advantage of what those challenges may be um, being experienced in the home. They offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and counseling with trained professionals and group um, group-based learning activities for both youth and parents. And they also happen to operate all of our, um, our family and youth success programs known as FAES, uh, operate a 24-hour hotline for families who may have urgent um, needs that need to be met. Additionally, another program that works to really strengthen some processes and often what's often overlooked is the father, the fathership role um, in parenting. And so our fatherhood effect program provides parenting education and resources to father to strengthen and acknowledge that fathers play an important role in, in, in the rearing of their children and have a unique role that often um, can be easily overlooked um, by a variety of systems and processes. So we have a, a targeted program that helps to really strengthen the fatherhood um, program and, uh, and the relationships. And hopefully that through those strong foundations, we're avoiding um, 
future traffickers exploiting the fact that children are missing um, that connection to a strong real, male role model. We also have our community and youth development and they provide funding and we provide technical and funding assistance to, to community-based organizations and ideally identifying um, and fostering positive youth development and building healthy families and, and resiliency within the community itself. It's a zip code based program that may not be available in every area of the state, but it, this is really looking to address um, incidences um, and zip code areas where there's high juvenile crime. And the idea is to provide preventative services and resources in those areas to, to ideally prevent and circumvent um, trafficking from um, being fostered in those communities. We also have the statewide youth services network and um, this works on positive youth development from ages six to 17. The funds allow for state level grantees to identify areas that may benefit from additional resources and target spe specific supports to local communities to maintain a statewide network. Um, examples of service pr services provided include mentoring and youth skills development in specific communities. Additionally, we have a lot of various uh, prevention and early intervention special initiatives. And one of the things that I'd like to highlight that I think are resources available to everyone is uh, parenting we know can be a difficult uh, challenge and, and poses different challenges based on different stages of development for youth. And so getparentingtips.com um, has a lot of resources for various stages and ages of de child development and speaks really to providing resources to help support families through, through the aging um, and growing process. Um, we also have specific targeted um, campaigns to help uh, address some of the things that are high needs that we're seeing currently. Um, safe sleep campaign, uh, a lot of resources on what need, we need to do to prevent co-sleeping to avoid um, young infant death. And then um, one of the things, especially with COVID, we've re-energized our suicide prevention programs um, and prevention campaigns. Uh, with COVID, what we're seeing is a lot of youth out in the community with strong, healthy connections um, are struggling through all of the challenges that come along with COVID and the new life that um, we all lead in, in isolation. Um, and so one of the things that we're concerned about when it comes to the suicide prevention component, if, if youth with um, strong, healthy attachments are struggling in this way, we have concerns for those who may be at risk um, because they don't have those strong and healthy connections. So we've kind of um, ramped up our suicide prevention campaigns to help support these things. We also have the Texas Youth Hotline, and our hotline is a 24-7, 365 days a year. It is not a part of Child Protective Services, and we advertise it as such. And it really provides a free confidential service to both youth and parents um, and other family members um, who will find themselves in crisis and need. Um, and uh, they can help find counseling, low cost um, resources for families, uh, safe shelter, legal information, and local referrals um, for families um, and children experiencing this. And the, the Texas Youth Hotline um, takes calls, but they also take text and can respond via chat as well. And it's a group of trained um, staff and volunteers and they listen and they work to not judge whatever the circumstances may be. And they help to brainstorm solutions. And um, you know they have um, options and opportunities also where not only are they brainstorming solutions and action planning, but they can um, offer free messaging services for runaway youth for, um, you know, for youth who don't wanna communicate with their familial connections, but may want to still put a lifeline out there, they're able to create those connections. And they are also able to connect youth who are um, on a runaway status and looking to find the way, their way home. Um, they can con connect them with Operation Home Free and provide transportation resources to work on getting a youth back into um, off the streets and back into their homes. Thank you, Blanca. I think this was a really great kind of layout for the prevent. Do you wanna to touch on the uh, last 
Fuller's just briefly. Um, sure, just sure. Right, so right. let me, and I'm sorry, just I lost interest of time. in interest of time. We talked about, Todd talked about our faith-based engagement and also under protect and prosecute, we work multidisciplinary approaches to address those things. Uh, we partnered heavily with the providing support with the governor's office and our planning and our cross collaboration. We work with care coordination teams and advocacy centers. And um, Todd had mentioned a little bit about what we're working on with TEA. But one of the care, the pieces that we work with is really to try to, once we've identified a, a victim, is really to wrap services around through the care coordination teams that are being established across the state and our advocate agencies and working to partner advocates advocacy work um, specifically with an identified victim. We're also working with the Texas Alliance for Children and Families and the um, Texas Network of Youth Services to really work on um, establishing and working to build provider capacity to address these needs for the, the children and youth identified. Um, again, this highlights just a little bit of what we're doing. Um, again, if you need any more information, feel free to contact me and I'll go ahead and hand it off to Major Kyle Matheson with the Department of Family and po uh, the Department of Public Safety. Hey, thanks, Monica Denise. I'm Kyle Matheson with the Department of Public Safety Criminal Investigations Division from Austin Headquarters. DPS has been very fortunate to partner with law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, and victim service pro providers across the state, and our success in combating human trafficking would not be possible without those partners. But in an effort to really showcase how the collaboration works, I'd like to give a short brief of a trafficking case that was worked by a group of special agents in the Houston office. In September 2017, just really on the aftermath of dealing with Hurricane Harvey, a DPS special agent was given valuable information from a child sex trafficking victim who had escaped from her pimp. You know, acting on the information, agents located the hotel and witnessed the trafficker take a teenage girl into a hotel room with a John. The agents responded and were able to recover the 15 year old victim who was also listed as a missing child through uh, nickname. Agents then arrested the trafficker and the, and the John. This was done, you know, not just by DPS special agents, but also with the help of highway patrol troopers and our Southeast Region Special Response Team. Additionally, officers located in the traffickers hotel room, four young female adults and a four month old baby that belonged to the pimp. After analyzing hours of evidence, special agents were able to recover an additional child victim who was trafficked by this pimp who was also 15 years old. With the help of our, our partners with DPS Victim Support Services, DFPS, the Harris County Children's Assessment Center and NGOs, the child victims were given the opportunity and, and received proper care. You know, our partners with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Houston successfully prosecuted the trafficker, and this past September, he, he received 25 years in federal prison. The Harris County District Attorney's Office prosecuted the John, and he received four years in state prison. You know, to highlight, this investigation did not happen by one officer or one agency. It took a collaborative response from numerous entities to be successful. There was actually nine or ten different agencies and organizations that had a hand in this case which is common for most human trafficking cases. You know, having a multidisciplinary approach in combating trafficking and providing victim care is the road to success in these cases. And one of the main reasons this case was ever brought to law enforcement's attention was because of that brave 15 year old girl who escaped from her trafficker and made an outcry. But not only was she making an outcry of being sexually trafficked, she provided real time information to a police officer about her trafficker. And because of that accurate information, what normally takes weeks and sometimes months to investigate in these cases, this was done in less than 36 hours. Since this investigation and the implementation of the coordinating council, the governor's office, sex trafficking team, and the care coordination teams that have been implemented across the state, and the many stakeholders that are on this call, we've progressed in our abilities with, with victim care, with community awareness, and law enforcement's capabilities and work in trafficking investigations. And in closing, I'm very happy to say that the child who escaped from her trafficker and the 15 year old who was recovered from that hotel room are currently out of the life, they have normal jobs and they're getting back to a normal life. Brandy, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, did I have the right name? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I am Brandy Souls. I'm with the Texas uh, Human. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm a little. I, I got distracted. Um, I'm, I'm with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. I'm a program specialist for the 
Texas Human Trafficking Resource Center here. And um, I'll, I'll echo the sentiment that uh, partnership is so important. We are exponentially better together. Uh, HHSC partners with other state agencies and non-governmental organizations and survivors to improve the resources and services we provide. Um, so my, uh, my section of HHSC is the, again, the Human Trafficking Resource Center. And uh, we're available to assist the public with locating resources they seek, such as training uh, materials and services throughout the state. Um, so an example of one of the initiatives uh, we could not have tackled without collaboration is that of training for healthcare practitioners. Uh, so HHSC collaborated with 11 different Texas healthcare licensing boards and the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, NITAC for short, on human trafficking training for healthcare practitioners. Um, so the licensing boards that we uh, collaborated with are listed there in the prevent column. And so I won't list those off for you, but um, they're, they have been instrumental in um, moving this initiative forward. Uh, we're also working with training developers to ensure that their healthcare focused human trafficking trainings meet our training standards um, so we can offer quality courses to healthcare practitioners. Uh, and as a result of these partnerships, nearly 1 million um, healthcare practitioners throughout the state now have access to uh, this new, newly required HHSC approved. Uh, human trafficking trainings. And um, if you'd like to learn more about this initiative or if you have a training you'd like to submit, um, I will put um, our website in the chat box when I'm done. Um, and I'd also like to take this time to uh, tell you about the upcoming National Crime Victims Rights Week, which is April 18th through the 24th. Um, our uh, HHSC's Family Violence Program is currently partnering with, um, uh, partnering to commemorate this week with the National Crime Victims Rights Week Central Texas chapter to show the documentary Be Relentless. And we'll be hosting a panel of human trafficking specialists and survival at survivor advocates along with that documentary showing. And I will also put links to the, those organizations in the chat as well. Um, so the, the National Crime Victims Service Awards um, is also a part of that. If you want to nominate um, um, any individual or organization um, for outstanding achievements in supporting victims and victim services in the Central Texas area, that can also be found on the, um, the information I'll put in the chat. Um, and so the, the groups that we are partnering with for that initiative um, are kind of sprinkled out um, in the different categories here and protect and provide support. Um, and those include the Austin Police Department, the uh, TASA, Texas Association Against Sexual Assault, uh, Texas Municipal Police Association, um, MAD, uh, Refugee Crisis Center, and uh, several others. Um, and um, I'm not sure, I don't think I need to get into um, much else, but those are, so, I just wanted to highlight those two big things that we've been working on. And um, in addition to that, we also offer um, webinars. We have a lot of um, contractors, like family violence, program contractors um, in, and our um, uh, women's health programs and, um, and our central, uh, I'm sorry, our uh, children's advocacy centers uh, throughout Texas and also our abstinence education program within our agency. And uh, we have um, contractors with each of those programs that we um, have um, partnered with to 
provide information and resources regarding human trafficking, but I won't go into all those details. Um, so with that, I will um, pass it on to um, Mary Winston with, Winston with TDLR. Thank you. Good afternoon. Report HT at tdlr.texas.gov. I wanted to provide this email address before I kind of get into things a little more to just let everyone know that if you see signs of trafficking in a massage establishment or a nail salon, cosmetology salon, please simply send us an email at reportht at tdlr.texas.gov. My name is Mary Winston and I manage TDLR's um, anti-trafficking unit. The Department of Licensing and Regulation regulates a variety of uh, professions including massage therapists, massage establishments, and massage therapy schools. We also regulate cosmetology and barbering. But through our regulation of massage therapy, we found that something called illicit massage businesses or IMBs have developed a definite unfortunate presence in the massage community. So, the massage industry has become a touch point. That's how TDLR became a touch point for trafficking. However, it's not limited to this bubble. There are so many industries that even if we don't regulate or oversee, that still touch throughout Texas. It touches lives of both youth and adults and requires a multifaceted response to really make an impact. How do we do that and how are we a part of that? With our small group, our anti-trafficking unit, we began, oh, a little over a year ago. But what hit us a little over a year ago? Um, this pandemic. That has limited what we can do, so, so to speak, on the ground. However, it hasn't limited our ability to partner. The group fosters relationships with statewide entities and local law enforcement as you see here, and we coordinate efforts with strategic partners, as you can see from the schematic. We also develop and integrate best practices to prevent repeat offenders in our neck of the woods, which is state licensure, that sometimes we found they use state licensure to legitimize businesses as fronts for human trafficking. We provide and we accept training from law enforcement and all of these entities. This information exchange is so important and helpful to fighting this awful, awful thing called trafficking. And we gather and analyze statistics. Again, information sharing, so important. Texas is a huge state. Not only is Texas a huge state, this thing crosses state boundaries. Unfortunately, Texas is has a problem with trafficking and we are often front and center and we're working to change that. As you see, we're talking about developing partnerships and we're spotlighting these four factors of prevention, protect, prosecute, and provide support. As you can see, we have uh, several of these are repeated on each of um, our little blocks here. Why? Because we um, actually across all aspects from prevention to providing support. I'll just start with the first one under prevent. We have heard from the Office of Attorney General. We've heard from the Office of the Governor. And then we're going to go down. I'm not going to read all of those. But that goes into prevention. But when we go into providing support, you're going to see some of the same partners on there as well. They go from information exchange to boots on the ground to stopping this from ever starting, prevention, and providing support. This incorporates our NGOs, our non-governmental organizations, which are social service organizations, and it starts with our police departments that you'll see under protect. But between information sharing with the council that we have here and all of the duties that we all bring to the table and responsibilities, the ultimate goal for us is partnership and collaboration to fight trafficking as much as we can as a state agency as we started off at top. We're limited, but through these partnerships, we can make a difference. Again, 
reportht at tdlr.texas.gov. We want to get that out there for our small bit of the world, but we also want to know that you know we're here to partner with this greater um, organization, the Coordinating Council, and for the greater good of Texas to fight trafficking. And with this, I want to turn this over to, I think we have Ron today and um, from TABC and possibly Nick. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mary. I think it's just me today, and I um, apologize if I'm sweating. Uh, it's kind of odd. Last week we had a, you know, below zero, and this week we can't get the heater off at our headquarters, so I'm sitting here sweating a little bit. So if you see sweat dripping off my face, I apologize, but um, I'll leave when we're done with this. Um, so I, I talked last a couple weeks ago on the protect part of the P, and I've been listening to all of these and. I think what, the, what I would like to get across is that the partner is the glue that holds all the peas together. Uh, without the partnership, and as I said last time, to me, partner means relationship. You have to build those relationships. You can call it networking, you can call it partner, you can call it whatever, but it needs to be a personal relationship where you know people and you can pick up the phone and you can contact those people and make that connection because none of us no matter how big of an agency we are, no matter how big our budget is, are going to be able to solve this problem alone. And I'm going to kind of follow in the footsteps of DPS and give a little more of a story, but um, a case study. But I want to talk about three big partnerships that TABC has done recently. And the first one was we conducted a gap analysis with uh, Sam Houston State and Texas A&M. And they basically looked at our um, enforcement, pro well, they looked at our entire agency and identified some things where we could improve and lo and behold there were there were a few that we could improve we were I was um, very happy I think a lot of it was things that we had already identified internally that we knew we needed to improve on of course resources manpower things of that nature and a few of them uh, the next uh, partnership that we did which was a not a, a direct result we were a little bit ahead of the curve on the gap analysis was grants from the governor's office we were very very fortunate uh, to have received a grant for a victim services coordinator, which I think is something that we at TABC were missing. We, we could send the, the cops out in the street and we could identify, rescue, put the bad guys in jail, shut down the businesses, but we weren't necessarily um, doing the best job of following up with the victims and providing that victim services. So we now have a full-time victim services coordinator. The grant also provided an additional position for a an attorney, which I'll explain a little bit better how we prosecute some of our cases internally on an administrative side and for a criminal intelligence analyst to help us be more proactive in identifying high probability locations that might be involved in trafficking. Um, so like I said, the, the, the partner is the glue that holds everything together. And the first P, prevent. One thing that's very unique, I have long, you see up there under prevent law enforcement agencies, obviously law enforcement agencies are very proactive. We're out there. It's hard to tell, did we prevent something? Uh, I used to talk about this a lot as a regular cop. To, if you drive by a 7-Eleven, did you potentially prevent it from being robbed? If you're, if you're out there being very proactive and visible uh, law enforcement, are you preventing uh, prostitution from occurring? Are you preventing uh, various crimes? So that's very important. I think non-governmental organizations are very big in preventing it, also providing services. And I have TABC internal there. We have some unique capabilities where we do with, uh, basically we look at applications that come in. So we'll look at the, the finances, they have to tell us what where they got their money, how they're gonna open this bar up. And if we find deficiencies in there, we'll look at that a little bit closer. Um, and that helps a lot. We'll also run criminal histories on them to see if they have a history. If they have certain crimes within a certain time frame. they're not eligible to get an alcohol permit. And we're being very proactive in preventing bad actors from coming into the alcoholic beverage industry. We also have a protest process where a community or a church can look at a, uh, they see that a bar is going to applying for a permit across the street. They can protest that location and keep that location from coming into business uh, if, if, if we, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So, so there's a lot of good things going on in the prevent world that, that I think help a lot. Uh, protect, uh, we talked about this a lot on the last uh, webinar that I was on. Um, and, and I think it's just law enforcement agencies, state and federal, don't tie yourself in. We, we frequently work with DPS. Obviously, we're hand in always, you know, side by side with them. 
FBI, one thing we've done uh, years past, back in 2013, we started a special investigations unit. We basically uh, stole from Paul to pay Peter, and we took out of hide a bunch of enforcement agents and had them assigned to long-term uh, organized criminal investigations, such as narcotics trafficking, money laundering, human trafficking, and other organized crime. Uh, we were so small at the time, we had to force multiply. And what we did was we put a lot of them on federal task forces. And that has worked out fantastic um, and, and continues to work out fantastic. The prosecute side is where we have our local and federal prosecutors. Uh, criminal, I, I, one thing I think that we, I haven't heard a lot of, and I think it's important, is when we have these major traffickers, let's hit them with every tool in our toolbox. And one of those tools is asset forfeiture. Um, if we can prove that, that a pimp or a trafficker has uh, a car that they're using to traffic these girls in, or they bought a house, or in our case, they, they bought a bar, or they're pimping the girls out of a bar, trafficking them out of there, or holding them there at a house, um, we worked very close with Hidalgo County DA's office and, uh, about a year ago, and some properties still under under uh, forfeiture. But you know we're we're not going to let that trafficker go back and get that property um, back. It's just she used it for for illegal purposes. We're going to take it and we're going to use it for law enforcement purposes. One of those unique law enforcement purposes we've used is also we we had a victim who was being threatened and we had to move her. And we were able to use asset forfeiture funds to help pay for her relocation. So those asset forfeiture funds are very, very important. Uh, using federal prosecutors, if it if it crosses uh, you know, the international boundaries, which we find a lot with international trafficking, it crosses state lines. A lot of times the federal prosecutors come in very handy. And the broader uh, border prosecutors unit has been huge. We worked with them. And, you know, if we hadn't worked with them, we're just kind of, um, you know, uh, cops and we're thinking very black and white. And uh, the border prosecutor actually helped us with a case where they identified a statute of limitations concern that we had. And we were able to overcome that due to the thanks to Hidalgo County and the border prosecutors unit who found that we were able to prosecute the trafficker for um, sexual abuse of a child versus the human trafficking. So uh, find a different way, you know, don't, don't let the hurdles block you. You, you, can, you can overcome those hurdles. And providing support, non-governmental organizations, Refugee Services of Texas, I have them on there because uh, go back to the partner, the relationships, uh, the case that uh, I've already basically gone over, I'm not gonna go over it again, but that case began with historical information and a relationship that we had with Refugee Services of Texas, where they literally called uh, me and said, hey, Ron, do you, do you want this case? We have these victims, uh, they're making outcries. It's a, it was about eight, nine years old, but they were trafficked out of a bar. Are you interested? If we didn't have that relationship, we never would have gotten that case. So I think that that relationship is, is, is utmost important, and that's really the P, the partnership, and that's what makes it so important. Rio Grande Legal Services, that was the group that we worked with down in McAllen also to provide some of the uh, T visas and U visas and some of the financial uh, resources to for the victims. Um, I, I, that pretty much sums up what I have. One thing I want to talk about also, the, the grants. One partnership that I think is highly, highly important, and it's been talked about and some other uh, closely talked about, but one thing that we did is we partnered with the distributors. So our alcohol distributors, uh, the, the various um, Budweiser, Coors that are out there, that they're in the bar every day. They're going into the bar, behind the bar, stocking the shelves, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the more eyes and ears we can have. So what we did was we started a, it's a very brief program. It's about 15 to 20 minutes and we go in. Uh, the bad part about it is they start their shifts extremely early, about four in the morning. So we're there at their shop about four in the morning with about a hundred drivers sitting there. And, um, and, and it's proven very successful. We have received, uh, we have seen an, an, up, an increase in uh, calls uh, reporting human trafficking. And I, I like to think that it's a direct result of, of, of those uh, engagements that we have, have done with the distributing um, permittees that are out there in the field. So uh, that sums up my part. I, I can't say thank you enough. Um, if you need anything from TABC, please reach out to us. And I will pass it over to Parks and Wildlife, uh, Jimmy, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, this, like I said, this is Jimmy Lindsay with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, this afternoon during this webinar, I'd like to inform everyone on TPWD's partnerships, uh, spotlights, and roles as part of this Texas Human Trafficking Prevention Coordination Council. Uh, these roles include our prevent, protect, and provide support. And 
I'd like to echo on, you know, some of what the speakers be before me said, a lot of this cannot be done without the partnership with other agencies. Uh, the more partnerships we have out there, the, <clears throat> that inner working with other agencies makes all these supporting roles possible. Uh, for instance, I'm going to start out with our, our prevent support role. Uh, TPWD continues to, to help prevent human trafficking by being proactive and networking with other agencies. Uh, for example, this coordination uh, council meeting we have, we get to hear from other, other agencies and seeing what is out there, what other um, resources are available. And so being able to obtain that information, we're able to push that out to the field so that our, our state park officers and our game wardens out there are, are up to speed on the different resources available. Uh, our game wardens and park police officers are given training to help identify possible human trafficking events. Uh, our game wardens and park police officers are given training on the interdiction for uh, protection of children. This training is mandated as part of the field training program for all new officers. So we continue to push that training out to not only our cadets that are going through the academy, but the ones out in the field right now that, that may have not got that, that training as of yet. So we continue to push that out. Also, along with the training, game wards and park officers are also given available resources for additional information. Uh, these resources are found by working close with other agencies to see what training and resources are available. And other, like I like used before, this coordination council meeting, I mean, you, you can see the list of, of speakers that we have on these, these, uh, these meetings. And at every meeting, I'm learning something new as far as a resource that's out available or another contact to give uh, our field out there. So that, that helps give them those resources on, on who to contact if, if we have any questions or, or, uh, or maybe we, we see something that, that we would like to pass on to other resources out there. So it's a great, great way to network and continue that, that partnership. Oh, another big portion of, of, of uh, the partnership is to protect support. Uh, TPWD provides protect support by partnering with our other, excuse me, other agencies and sharing information of possible human trafficking events. Uh, an example of this was back in October of 2020 when Texas Game Wardens and State Park Police Officers participated in the Crimes Against Children Patrol operation. This operation was part of DPS-led interdiction for protection of children program with multiple LE agencies participating throughout the state. So this kind of goes into what I said earlier, uh, that partnership with the different agencies and working together for a common goal is a big part of, of each one of these different support roles that we're in. That partnership, that networking, that sharing of information is a big, big part of it. Uh, also, TPWD continues to stay vigilant and proactive while patrolling rural areas and state parks. With training received, officers look for signs of possible human trafficking while on patrol in these areas. Uh, as game wardens and park police officers, we're out there in those those areas that some officers aren't aren't able to get to. For instance, like uh, some of these rural areas, just due to our all-terrain vehicles and such. So we're able to be in some of these different areas and able to see different things and pass that information on if we come across anything. So it's uh, working in different areas where other LE officers may not be able to work in, just due to locations, and passing along any information we may. Uh, see if we see something that that kind of just raises a red flag and we're like, oh, that that doesn't look right. We're able to pass that information on to the other officers also, other resources to see what what they think and, and if they uh, want to investigate on it. So it's always that that sharing of information and, and different operations we have going on. And as far as providing support, uh, you know, we TPWD helps provide the support by being able to know what resources are available to help, help these victims. And like I said, I, I hate to be a broken record, but this this meeting right now, like I said, you're being informed on different resources out there. Who who to contact uh, if you have a question? What what's available out there? Not only for the officers, but for those victims. So so we know who to contact if we have any questions or would like to get whether it's extra training on, on certain things in relation to human trafficking. Uh, it's all about partnerships. It's all about networking. It's all working together to to you know for for common goal. So uh, I thank you all, thank all the presenters, uh, thank everybody out there on this webinar. And let me introduce Courtney. She's with the Texas, excuse me, Texas Workforce Commission and she'll be our next speaker. Thank you all. Hi, uh, thank you, Jimmy. Yes, I'm Courtney Arbor. I'm the Workforce Director at the Texas Workforce Commission. 
Uh, and some of you know a lot about the workforce system in Texas, but you may be wondering, what is the role of the workforce system or why are they even uh, participating here? We're happy to be part of the coordinating council and to participate in this effort. The workforce system in Texas is, is huge. TWC is one part of that. Uh, community colleges and different uh, nonprofits and grantees who help prepare people for work through training or educating them about jobs. Uh, people in the K-12 system, we're all part of a big workforce system where we're trying to help Texas employers find the talent they need and also upskill people of all ages to try to get them into jobs that are great in greatest demand in their local area. And so I've, here on the slide, you'll see some of the different partners that we work with at the Workforce Commission directly. But the reason we're engaged and really passionate about this um, topic and is that we want to be one of the many solutions for survivors in helping them to get back on their feet, uh, bring self-sufficiency into their homes through work, through education, through connecting with other resources that help them stabilize the home and, and get back to work. So we see ourselves as one of many uh, pieces to the puzzle on the, on the recovery side. Um, we work at the Workforce Commission. We have hundreds of sites throughout the state where we are either, there's about 450 adult education literacy grantees that receive funding from us, for instance. And if a person lacks a high school equivalency and sometimes even needs some occupational training, they can connect with one of our adult education programs at different ISDs or education service centers, workforce boards, community colleges, and connect and get no cost training uh, and education so that they can then go on to get their high school equivalency and, and keep moving forward in their, in their education and their career. We have 180 workforce solutions offices throughout the state where a person can go in, talk to a case manager, work on their resume, look for work uh, in the workintexas.com or, or other systems. My Texas career uh, is another online uh, source. Those workforce solutions offices are have a lot of uh, staff paid to answer questions and help people get more comfortable with the idea of going back to work. So we're partnering with everyone else in the um, trafficking uh, prevention coordinating council and many other nonprofits locally and at the state level to do what we can to help survivors connect and work on their career ladder and education ladder to help um, get to a place of, of greater self-sufficiency in their home because we all uh, most of us agree there's a lot of value in steady employment and having a, a roadmap for that employment and how to how to increase your wages and, and stability through that. Uh, I'm going to keep mine short. We've covered a lot of great material today and you heard from, from my peers. I want to turn this over now to who I think is the most critical voice in all of the work we're doing as a, as a uh, council and just in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, Kathy McGibbon Givens is with us today. Kathy is a co-founder of 1211 Partners. She is a survivor and will share with us a survivor perspective that I know you'll appreciate as much as we do. Kathy, thank you so much to you and the other uh, groups, leadership council members who provide the council with such important perspective that we um, might not otherwise be aware of. And you're really helping to guide our, our actions and our, and our thoughts on this topic. So Kathy, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Courtney. I really, um, I'm excited to be here with, with everyone. Um, like uh, Courtney mentioned, my name is Kathy McGibbon Givens, and I am here representing um, the Human Trafficking Survivors Leadership Council, uh, which is comprised of amazing survivor leaders and overcomers. Um, and so as we go through the next couple of slides, I want you to keep in mind that this council is comprised of diverse um, perspectives. We all have different lived experiences. The council, me, myself, I I'm here representing the council, but the council also represents a wide, a vast, um, diverse population and community of survivors and overcomers. And so we know that everyone's lived experience is different. And so we've tried our best just try to come together and um, share our perspectives with you today. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the, um, the current members of the council because they put in, you know, such great amount of work. So I'm going to really quickly just name them really quick. Um, so our le survivor leader, the leader 
of the council is uh, Sophia Strother, and she is affiliated with Empowerment Driven by Knowledge Coalition. We have Brooke Axtell with Freedom United. She is Rising in Tassa. Becca Carey with Hands of Justice. Rebecca Charleston of the Jensen Project. Rachel Fisher with Street Grace. Allie Franklin with Safe Austin, Ava Hartley with Severa, um, Tony McKinley with Madeline House, Lisa Michelle, No Strings Attached, Carla Solomon with A21, um, and Sandy Storm with Deliver Fund. I had to take a moment just to shout them out uh, because they did put in so much, so much work, and I'm just very honored to work alongside these amazing individuals. So our mission um, for, the, for the council it's, it's pretty much, I think it would be in alignment with, with all of you, right? Um, we want to end human trafficking. And so our mission is to review and recommend and to partner with you guys uh, to develop survivor-informed po policies and best practices that address commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking across the state of Texas. Um, and our vision, again, the same and in alignment with many of you is to end human trafficking um, through, to, we wanna see cultural change and sustainable practices that enhance efforts to end commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking. Um, and so uh, the first point, you know, is, is integrate survivor input and promote survivor leadership. We survivor leaders and overcomers, we're really advocating for this. Um, you, you'll probably, you, you've probably heard this before, you know, every survivor leader that you talk to, every overcomer that you talk to, we're like, hey, did you get survivor input? And are you um, including survivors in the process? Because we believe, I think someone mentioned it earlier, but partnership is so critical in order to end this problem. Um, this is a collaborative approach, right? We cannot do, survivor leaders and survivors cannot do it alone. We need you, but we also want to be included in your work, right? And so we, that is just, you know, that's from the, the moment of um, development to implementation. We encourage, um, you know, all of our partners to include survivor voices, include survivor input in whatever you're working on from start to finish, because you know, we're the ones that have the experience and we're the ones that can tell you like and bring precious intel to the table um, to increase your, uh, the success of your efforts. And so um, and we have suggested maybe coming up with a, um, a set of standard of engagement maybe. Um, and then also just measuring that, measuring those standards. Like are our partners um, engaging survivors? How are they engaging survivors? Are they, you know, trauma informed? Are they being cult are they culturally competent? Um, you know, all those things matter in engaging survivors. It's it's a little more than just bringing a survivor on the end of a project just to put their stamp of approval on it, but really getting into involving them in the weeds of the process. Um, again, you would be so surprised by the, the 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 things that survivors can bring to the table survivor leaders and survivors alike can bring to the table just by listening to them um you know even in this work i've been doing this work for you know quite some time and i'm a survivor myself and i'll still hear stories from those you know emerging leaders and i'm like what that really happened this is critical to what i'm working on so we really encourage that and also assessing how a multidisciplinary task force incorporate the expertise of survivors and utilize lived experiences are survivors um, being included in the collaborative effort to support and um, encourage these these disciplinary agencies right so are we training law enforcement are we engaging with prosecutors are you know, are you including survivors um, in all of these efforts? And of course, identify gaps and opportunities. We um, want to emphasize right there, you know, specifically for non-traditional partners, right? We want to include non-traditional partners in that. There are so many things that they can bring to the table. Um, and, you know, we've come a long way in this in this anti-trafficking movement, but we do recognize that there are some gaps. Um, and I think that this is just always gonna be a growing process. We're always gonna be able to um, identify opportunities to get better at what we do. And so we encourage that, you know, we partner with non-traditional partners um, to figure out what those gaps and opportunities may be. And so the next slide talks about, um, you know, strategic partners developing a collaborative approach for partners with survivor groups like this council. We want to see more of this. We want to see this council grow. We want to see agencies, you know, maybe developing their own councils um, so that they can have the input 
of survivors that we talked about in the beginning, from beginning to end, throughout the entire process, you're engaging, you're, um, you're encouraging survivor leadership, you're empowering survivor leadership, right? Not just to, again, not just to hear their stories, but to really get the intel and the advice that, um, that only they can give, really. So um, we encourage that. And then we talked about non-traditional partnerships. This should not partners should be sought um, who can identify resource gaps and overcome limitations to access for survivors by underserved and underrepresented populations. Who who's out there that's already doing it, right? Who is serving the LBG2QI community? Um, people of color, uh, individuals with disabilities, survivors with disabilities. Um, who's out there doing the work already? and partnering with them, right? So thinking outside of the anti-trafficking box, it's really easy to kind of get sucked up into the, the same language and the same practices, but we wanna think outside the box and reach and uh, join arms with our non-traditional partners, the partners that are already fighting, you know, hate and racism and um, advocating for children and youth with disabilities and already doing work with foster care youth and transitional youth. We wanna get into, kind of like get into their lanes and, and invite them into our box of the anti-trafficking movement. So that's one of the things that we um, completely are, you know, advocating for is to really grow this movement by partnering with, with people and agencies that we wouldn't think of. Um, and then let's see, the next slide is not mine, but I am so awesome. I'm so, uh, again, honored just to be here with you guys. And um, again, you know, survivors understand that we cannot do it without you. Um, and we hope that you would see the value in bringing us to your tables as well. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, we have covered a lot of different partnerships here today, and hopefully that is getting you all thinking and um, possibly identifying ways that you can work with either the members of the coordinating council, other people on this webinar, uh, and partnering with them going forward. Part of our action plan, so we devised the plan and our plan involved investing in building expertise, um, academic expertise, business and community expertise to drive policy and better practices in the trafficking world and to encourage the growth of public and private partnerships. And in order to do that, we have to implement all these things we're talking about. You've seen lots of partnerships that the various uh, people you've heard from are doing and we just need to keep implementing those going forward. We also need to listen to what Kathy said and continue to enlist um, survivors early and often in the process um, because they provide a perspective that is really important and needs to be heard. Great, thank you, Kara. Um, and now I'm gonna send it over to Claire and we're gonna open it up to the panel for some questions. Are you there? I can start with a couple. You are there. Um, okay, so, um, I know that we've answered a few questions in the Q&A, um, but I just, I think there's a lot of really fantastic uh, feedback, some really great examples of the importance and benefit of partnerships. Um, I want to kind of get the opinion of the panelists that we have now. Um, what would be your advice to the listeners that we have here and the attendees of the webinar um, regarding how they can improve their collaborative efforts or partnerships? We can jump in. Um, I'm happy to chime in if nobody is. Yeah, I was just about to, Todd. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would encourage people to do that are looking um, at how they can better collaborate and coordinate locally is really to start maybe with a bit of a self-assessment about what it is that either you, if you're an individual, are passionate about, what drew you to this issue, um, or if you're an organization, you know, what are your strengths and where do you align um, with this issue already? Like Kathy was saying, you know, maybe you are 
already really adept at serving high risk youth or youth at risk of homelessness or, or kids with certain risk factors. Um, and then I would say, you need to look at the landscape of your local community. Don't assume that you need to go and create a brand new program or service. Oh, I bet there's no shelter. We need to go and create a shelter in our community that never existed. The chances are there is um, a coalition or group of people that are working on this, that are collaborating already that you can connect with and really figure out how do you align with that. I see a lot of sort of turf war and territorialism sometime with this issue, but the reality is it's such a big issue. There's room for everyone in the sandbox and we need to make sure that we're all contributing to this issue, um, and giving our best selves and, and whatever our strengths are uh, and not duplicating or competing with each other. Great, great. Um, okay. All right, Emily, I'm gonna try one last time. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes, you can. Okay, great. Thank you. So I just had a couple of follow up questions um, for a few members. If we still have time, I know some people are hopping off and that's okay too. Um, but I thought a couple of interesting things that some of you mentioned, um, Blanca, you were talking specifically about um, COVID and the struggles and sort of the new programs you're doing for suicide prevention and with youth. And I was hoping you could maybe just kind of expand on that with some of the challenges that you're seeing um, and expand on that a little bit. Well, and, <clears throat> yes, and I think I'll also ask, um, I don't know if Brandy's on too, to talk about some of the mental health resources that are that we can um, also put out there for individuals. With COVID, there's a lot of challenges to new routines and new processes, and there's been a spike nationwide in, su in teen suicide and youth who are struggling with, with um, the new routine of not being able to socialize, uh, the distancing, the not being in school. A, a lot of key milestones for, for youth have been missed um, for those that were seniors or their first freshman year or transition. Um, and with adolescence and hormones and everything that goes with it, this is just an added stressor. And so one of the things that we've done is try to provide resources because there has been an increase in suicide prevention. We've always had suicide prevention as, as a concern, and we've always had it as an, an initiative that we work to, to, to strengthen. But because of what we were hearing with COVID responses in the community, the concern is, is that youth who are not connected to resources um, may be even more at risk. And so we just, we see suicide prevention as something that, that may be existing for people as a result of, you know, the snowfall, the, the, what I call the snowball of COVID community challenges that exist in today's society. Does that help answer your question a little bit, Claire? Claire. Um, I think I'm just thinking Claire's been kicked, kicked um, in and out. Um, Brittany, did you want to piggyback on some of the, men oh, it looks like you had already responded, some of the mental health uh, services yes, available. Yes, I, um, I, I lost connectivity there for a second. I don't know if that was just me or for everybody, but yes, um, I've, I've included there in the chat, the HHSC mental health and substance use uh, website, which has a lot of information on this topic. Thank you, Blanca. Yes, yes. And this is just another way in, we, in which we partner that connection, a great example of that. We're not the ones providing that resource, but we know we're aware of the fact that they have that resource and we can make those connections. Thank you so much, Blanca. Great. Thank you both. Uh, Claire, is there another question that, that you have for us or does that kind of wrap up the committee? Um, um, as we wrap up, what are some of you think the biggest challenges or, or the things that you would like to um, let some of the attendees know that your agency covered or the biggest things that we really need to focus on, um, other than obviously the strategies that we've talked about in fighting um, this crime of human trafficking? What are some of your challenges from your agency's perspective that you're encountering? Emily, I'll, I'll chime in with TABC and some of the, the various um, 
challenges that we're seeing is obviously manpower funding. These cases are not quick wins. Um, our, our special investigations unit used to work a lot of narcotics cases. Um, those are those are I don't want to say easy because they're they're far from easy, but they they're you can go in and you know you we can shut down a bar for narcotics you know after a couple of operations and, and we can affect that that uh, community improve the community based on that that quick win. But human trafficking is not a quick win. It's very um, resource intensive. It's very long. You're working with victims who most often do not see themselves as victims at least initially. Um, Sometimes there are undocumented immigrants, uh, so you have immigration issues. Uh, sometimes they're underage, so you have uh, issues with them being minors. Um, so those are some of the, the major things that we run into. Uh, obviously, then it comes into uh, the funding of keeping these cases open for long periods of time. Um, that, that, of course, becomes a, a concern. We know that a location might be you know, if we're on our end, we can shut down a bar quickly. We want to do it as quick as possible, but sometimes human trafficking does not happen quickly. So we look for the low hanging fruit. Maybe we also have narcotics or we have drink solicitation. Um, some of those issues, statute of limitations was an issue with the case that we had down in McAllen where we're, we ran into that issue. Uh, those are being addressed as we speak in this legislative session and, and have been corrected in some of the past, but those were some, that was one major concern that we ran into there was that statute of limitations issue. Uh, luckily, through partnering and working with uh, the Border Prosecutor Unit, the Hidalgo County DA's office, DPS, FBI, Homeland Security, and the various NGOs, uh, we were able to, to still successfully prosecute that case and several others, but that's what it took. It was, it took that partnering. Um, I would like to jump on what Kathy said about getting victims involved early. Uh, we, we have done that, and I think I, I missed that on the partnership part. Uh, we created a three-week training program for our special investigations unit agents and some of our enforcement agents, and we plan to open that up to all law enforcement. It is specific to licensed locations, bars, cantinas, things of that nature, and how to work a human trafficking case. But one thing we did was we brought in a victim and she basically consulted with us from start to finish to make sure that it was as real as possible and that we were taking into account that victimology and understanding from the victim's perspective and um, not losing sight of that, that we treat them as victims. So often they are involved in other criminal activity and as cops, we wanna treat them as, as criminals and we need to get away from that. We need to focus on them as victims and that's another challenge is making sure that our law enforcement recognizes them as victims, not as, as criminals. So those are two things, obviously, money, people, time, uh, having patience. I think asking my bosses to have patience with some of these cases is huge. And then uh, getting the victims involved um, early on and getting them to self-identify would be huge. Ron, I think that's a great kind of um, summary of a lot of the high points that we talked about today. Um, so if you all would just kind of join me in thanking our panelists, um, thank you for your perspective, thank you for your information, thank you for kind of leading these webinars the last five weeks. And I want to remind everyone, uh, find us on social media, um, kind of meetings and events. And if you have any questions or if you want to get to us, just uh, email us at humantraffic.org.com.